today's session that Justice Lewis is unable to attend today, but he will be participating in the decision of these cases. May it please, excuse me, may it please the court, Melanie Dale Serber on behalf of the state of Florida. This case is about statutes that concern different actors operating in different capacities that were enacted by different legislative bodies based upon different policy rationales. The importance of that statement is a statement this court made in the Bretherick decision. The reason I immediately cite that specific line is because we are dealing with two completely different laws that were enacted by different legislative bodies. 77605 was enacted in 1974. It had codified the long recognized duty that an officer never had to retreat. Stand Your Ground was enacted for a completely different reason in 2005. It codified the abrogation of the average citizen's duty to retreat, where an average citizen no longer had to retreat in the face of danger. That's important because in this case below, the fourth DCA stopped at the general proposition that person encompassed everyone. However, that's not the only way to look at the, the history of the statute or wait, at if, the plain but, language of the statute. Okay, but if you just, say person, then it encompasses everybody. And I, my struggle, I mean, I, I see the fact that was, uh, police officers have no duty to retreat, so the whole notion of the statute really would not be applicable. But how do you get around that, one, that a law enforcement officer obviously is a person, and it, was, it didn't say a citizen, didn't say, it said a person. I don't know if, if it's plain. Then what, how do you, what else do you go to? Do you go to the, are, are you saying you read the, the whole statute, that statute together? Well, what, you have to look at the entire 776. So you and, look at the whole statute, yes. not just person. Not just the Stand Your Ground Law as it was enacted in 2005. No, you, you look have at the entire statute, 776, which is 776032 is what was enacted in 05. 77605 is the law enforcement statute. They're part of the same section. So when there is a specific statute that covers the actions a, that could be similar, the specific controls over the general. That would be generally true. And again, I'm sympathetic to the mm -hmm. argument here that law enforcement officer you know, was indicted uh, for manslaughter. I don't know, you know the facts, but that's a, quite an unusual situation and then uh, so what is it that says the specific controls over the general unless there is ambiguity in the general statute? It's not that there's ambiguity. When, you look at the le when, when you're looking at the statutory construction as a whole, it doesn't stop with we have any person. It's the plain language, and if there is a specific statute that covers the same conduct or similar conduct, then the specific statute controls. It's not going into legislative intent. That is part of the plain well, reading of the law. What does it mean that law enforcement officers get two protections? I mean, they get this protection and they get that protection. Well, I mean, I mean what, what is it that would say that the legislature wasn't intending to give this law the broadest sweep as opposed to a narrower sweep well if it's becoming what did the legislature intend then there's some confusion about the statute we look to the legislative history as i cited in 2005 when this law was enacted it was the um, february 10th 
February 10th, 2005, the Senate bill, it's cited in the briefs, it's um, CS slash SB 436. There is a specific section that talks about use of force by law enforcement or correctional officers. When the legend, you can see when the committees were reviewing what was going on in the entire statute 776 as a whole, they recognized that law enforcement officers were already covered under 77605. They called it a limited liability. And I think when you look at that legislative history, those committee notes, when the law was enacted. Before we get to legislative history, could I get you to ask, answer a couple questions for me? The, the, so the, would you agree that the new law does at least two significant things, the first of which would be to um, do away with the duty to retreat for non-law enforcement officers outside their home, right? That, so that's one of the significant things. Yes. Um, but the other, the second significant thing is that it created an absolute immunity that could be raised pre-trial and bar trial, correct? I mean, that, that's a, a, a right that didn't exist before for anybody, correct? For the average citizen, yes. For anybody. No, nobody had an absolute immunity to raise self-defense pre-trial. I, I would disagree. I think under the law enforcement statutes from... And, I understand we're, we're really mincing words when we're talking about absolute immunity and qualified immunity. I mean, it, looking at the history of what qualified immunity means. You know, under you, the new statute, a fact finder can resolve disputes of fact and determine that factually, even in a disputed factually situ factual situation, that, um, that this immunity applies and therefore bars trial. And that, that's a new thing and that's significant. Would well, you that, agree? That is significant, but that wasn't but part of the new? statute. That is decisional law that created the process of how the immunity was going to be raised under the stand your ground law. That came out of this court in Dennis. But our decision was that that's what the statute did. Yes. Wasn't it? Okay. For the average citizen. And when you look at the history wait, wait, of the wait, statute. Wait, 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 wait. I don't think we addressed who. Right. Whether it was limited to the average citizen as opposed to a law enforcement officer, that's not was not addressed in that decision, was it? No. However, it, it seems so, that there's... So here's my question. So you agree that um, this statute did something significant in creating an absolute immunity, and by that I mean that you can get a hearing and have a factual determination before trial as to whether you're entitled to immunity and don't have to go to trial. And that's a, that's a new thing, correct? And law enforcement officers, nobody had that right before. Is that correct? No, I, law enforcement. I mean, the, all, th this isn't a case, This isn't something that comes up all the time. I mean, when you do the research with respect to law enforcement officers, I think particularly with this statute, there's 22 cases that come up in the so, state of so Florida. So, so if the old statute provided the same opportunity to get a pretrial determination, then why are we here? It, because well, why can't we just take the judge's findings of fact that this officer was acting in self-defense and get immunity under the old statute because because you say that the old they had that right under the old statute they have the right to claim immunity it's been called a qualified immunity it's been called the defense of qualified immunity i recognize there's mincing of terms however there's never been a bar to raising that defense pre-trial and i know then, that then why are we here because the fourth district for some reason didn't take the next step and look at whether or not this was a specific versus a general issue. They simply stopped with person means everyone. When so, in fact, so let me ask you a question. You're conceding that based on the trial judge's findings of fact that the officer, because the finding of fact is that he was acting in self-defense, so he is immune under the prior statute and there's no trial. It should, the case should be no. Decided. The argument is the officer doesn't get the less rigid standard that we've argued applies to the average citizen based on the enactment of Stand Your Ground. What the officer gets is the qualified immunity they can raise in, you know, it, the only examples we have as, as referenced in Brethrick are law enforcement officers raising this type of immunity in 1983 actions. But there's already a process for that. It's always been done by summary judgment motions. We have a similar well, motion. We know that summary judgment, that's different than what is available under the new law. Because we know under summary judgment, if there are disputed issues of material fact, there's no summary judgment. Isn't that correct? So I'm, I am somewhat mystified by your suggestion that there's no difference. So I, maybe I'm, help, no me, help, 
help clear up my mystification. Well, there is a difference. It's two different laws that have two different procedures, and that's what this fight comes down to, which procedure applies. And this, this position is... Well, and then who, who, does, who does the new statute say that its procedure applies to? It says any person, right? It says any person. Okay. However, yeah. police well, officers have never been considered uh, any person. Let me see if I can uh, parse out what you're trying to say here. And, and correct me if I'm wrong. It seems to me that your argument breaks down to any person is any citizen, including a police officer, except if the police officer is operating in his or her official capacity. And so you are, and correct me as I go here, that any person can use the statute, but if a police officer uh, is, is acting in his or her official capacity, then the statute concerning police officers is the statute that governs it. Is that, that is what exactly. act, you're, yes. you're breaking? Okay. And so, that is so because officers acting in their official capacity have always been protected under this officer statute. I mean, since it was codified in the 70s, but I mean, I said in case law, law, so, law enforcement officers, their duty is to go investigate the crime. They have to go to the crime. It's part of their job to okay, go and do so, this. So if that's the case, then... When the police officer is acting in his or her official capacity, does the part of the statute that talks about immunity or um, having a hearing to determine if you're even going to have a trial, is that part of it applicable, even well, though it's not under the specific law enforcement statute. No, because when you look at the enactment of the Stand Your Ground Law, 776032 is the immunity statute. 012, 013, and there's a third, and it's 031. Those are the three listed statutes that the legislature put in that allowed for the immunity, which has been termed absolute immunity. Immunity is immunity. I, I think that's what's happened here. When you look at the U.S. Supreme Court case law defining qualified immunity versus what this court has defined as absolute immunity in Dennis, it's the same. It's to prevent the trial from happening. The state has said the officer can raise it. However, it's a different process. It always has been, and that is the process that comes me, out of decisional let law. You, let me just ask you this because I'm a little confused. So, assuming you're correct. That there are statutes that provide this immunity. When, when, is, when is the first time that an officer can raise that, a police officer? Is it a defense later on in trial? When does he raise it? They can raise it in a motion to dismiss. A motion to dismiss? Under, under 3.190. Has that it's been, the comparable motion has that, that gets been, raised. Has that been done in the state? Is there a case? There is no case. The cases that I've cited involve, there's Lozano, which was a criminal case involving the statute, but that had already gone to trial. There's no criminal case, but there's nothing that prevents that from being raised. The only guidance we have are 1983 actions because law enforcement officers are not the same as average citizens. Well, this, this stand your ground statute obviously has been around for a few years now, and it seems like every single year there's a certain change in the legislature. If the legislature intended to exclude police officers from the Stand Your Ground statute, why didn't they say so? They certainly have ample opportunity. Well, they did when they enacted the statute. The statute doesn't no, include they could've, they could've 776. Said, they could've, it could have simply said this statute excludes police officers acting in the act of their, well, of their duty. If it said that, then we wouldn't be here today. Maybe. Well, I mean, 776032 is the immunity statute. It says a person who uses or threatens to use force is permitted in 776012, 776013, or 776031. That is a clear statement as to what statutes immunity applies in. Well, it could, it could have said a person does not include a police officer. I guess it would have sound silly, but they could have said that. Well, and, I, and if there's confusion, that's why the legislative, the, um, commi the committee, the, the, the committee notes that I referenced are important because they noted there are other statutes. They were talking in that 
in those committee notes, they were going through the different statutes that weren't included under the immunity law to explain this is where this type of protection is important. Here's a question. You're in your rebuttal, but I, I need to go back to you. You're saying it's 776.05 that's the specific? Yes. Well, that only covers uh, where they're making an arrest, where a law enforcement officer is making an arrest. Here, you have a situation where it was, they were responding to an emergency, so would 776.05 even apply, number one? Number two, we're talking about a very significant immunity. A defendant was charged with manslaughter. There is nothing in 776.05 which would allow the dismissal of a manslaughter charge because of a factual finding that there was, uh, that the force that was exerted was necessary. In fact, it's contrary, of course, to the indictment, which must have found, since it's manslaughter, that it wasn't necessary. So where is the, uh, where is the comparable, not only immunity, but uh, from immunity from prosecutions, this, to, you know, as opposed to civil liability, because that's what 1983 is. Yes. However, I, I think that's where it comes from. The word Well, what comes from? Qualified? Is that, no, no. 7-7, seven, seven, I just, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. apply other than when making an arrest, number one, so it's limited, and it doesn't seem to provide any, uh, any out for a pretrial dismissal for immunity. I, I'm just not seeing it. Well, the issue here is the facts that did come out, I mean, there's factual findings made, but our argument is there are disputed facts in this case, and it's efforts to make a lawful arrest because of resistance or threatened resistance to arrest. Well, now, getting into the facts, maybe we won't get there. So whether this was the proper case to actually find immunity, I don't see how we get into reweighing the well, facts. The position is because the judge found disputed facts below, and I think that's noted through the order, that as a matter of law, this case would go to trial. It doesn't go back for a new qualified immunity pleading. Let me, let me ask you this. Would you concede that in a case where it was undisputed that the officer was not making an arrest and that the other condition there in 05 did not obtain, that there was no um, th uh, uh, yes, okay, that, that, that condition did not obtain. Uh, would you concede in those circumstances that the stand your ground law would apply? We would concede if it's undisputed facts that the officer was acting properly in his authority, then under 77605, the motion no, no, no. would get granted. No, no, no. no that's and not my question. Immune. That's not my question. If it was, I'm specifically asking if there's no dispute uh, that the off uh, concerning the fact that the officer was not making an arrest, mm -hmm. okay, that it was, that, uh, that that's not in dispute. There's circumstances well, where that's not, it, it could not be that the officer's making an arrest. There's a confrontation that, that doesn't involve that. Would, then, would you then concede that the stand your ground law would apply? If the stand your ground law does apply, then we know once the judge has made findings of facts, that's, that's I don't think not it, well, appealable. I would concede that if the law would, applies. Did you hear my question? Yes. Would you if, answer it? Yes, if the law applies and it's correct. I'm asking you, would it apply? That was the question, yes. not the if. Okay, okay, you're saying the stand, stand your ground you're law saying so that There are circumstances where the stand your ground law would apply yes. to a law enforcement officer. Yes. Okay. There are. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I will save my minute 55. Thank you. Under any reasonable definition of the English language, a law enforcement officer is a person. Law enforcement officers are people too. May it please the court, Eric Schwartzreich, my co-counsel Anthony Bruno, and Deputy Peraza. Deputy Peraza is here in this courtroom today, not just as a law enforcement officer, but as a person. Because law enforcement officers are people too. Well, obviously, and we appreciate that, but the issue here is, would you agree that the overall, overarching purpose of the Stand Your Ground Law when it was enacted was to remove from the common law 
a common law duty to retreat, which police officers acting in their official capacity never had a duty to retreat. That's the exact opposite of what police officers bravely and courageously do every day. So the whole, if you look, forget 776.05, if you look at the whole statutory scheme, which just person, and look at it, since there wasn't a duty to retreat, how, co how can it apply to uh, law enforcement officers in their official capacity? Justice Perriente, I would, I would agree with you in part. Um, that is the intention of the standard ground law, was to abrogate the duty to retreat. But I don't agree with the proposition that law enforcement officers never had the duty to retreat. They have a duty to retreat during the course of a lawful arrest, or now the execution of a lawful duty. So if you have a scenario where- well, I'm sorry, you said they have a duty to there's retreat a duty to retreat during according the course to the of law. a lawful arrest? Yes. 776.05. The arrest statute, the law enforcement officer use of arrest, says a law enforcement officer has a duty to retreat from the course of a lawful arrest or execution of a legal duty. So to it, make it, a, it a says statement, they need not retreat need or not desist. Need not retreat. Efforts. I apologize. I but she spoke. said retreat, a duty to retreat. So that's that was the question. I, I apologize. They have the very opposite of a duty to retreat. They don't have to retreat. Right. I should be a better wordsmith as an attorney. I, I apologize. So. I had uh, mixed that up, but my point is, is that they don't always have no duty not to retreat. Did I get that right? I don't no, know. I don't know. Don't don't here. Okay. The point is, is that it's not absolute. But if an officer point, no, is not making as a law enforcement officer, it's it's absolute, isn't it? When tell me a circumstance when a law enforcement officer, in the exercise of his or her duties has a, a duty to retreat. When he's making, has a duty to retreat? When an has officer- Has a duty to retreat. According to Florida statute 776.05, if an officer is making a lawful arrest or in the execution of a lawful duty, then he has no duty to retreat. A circumstance that I can think of as I stand here would be let's say an officer makes an arrest outside of his jurisdiction and there's no packs between uh, different police agencies and somehow it's determined, if we were going into that statute, that it's not a lawful arrest, then under that situation, if you read the plain meaning of 77605, that officer would have a duty to retreat. So under that circumstance, that's where I make that argument. But more importantly here, what I think we have is apples and oranges. Let, let me ask you, I mean, my concern is not having the microphone on. Uh, uh, the, uh, can you tell us of a case where a process has been established that provides for a pretrial hearing on the question of immunity for an officer? The Dennis case. Now, later, Dennis and Peterson, which was held by the, by the Supreme Court or, or by your justices, where you outlined the procedure. Now, the burden has since shifted because the legislature, and I won't get into a separation of powers argument. Maybe I, I'm, I, I mistook. I'm talking about under the procedure of the pre existing statutes before the standing ground statutes. States claiming that under those statutes, police officers had always been entitled to argue this, this sort of immunity. Can you tell us of a, a situation or a process in place that provided for that in court? I, I don't agree with the argument of the Office of the Attorney General because what they're arguing is that it should, that 776.05, that the vehicle, which that's an affirmative defense, not an absolute immunity, their argument is that the vehicle should have been a C4 sworn motion to dismiss, which we all know if the facts are in dispute, they make an analogy that it's similar to a summary judgment in a civil case, that if the facts are in dispute, that it's game over. So the only process in place would have been a C4 motion? Would have been a C4 motion, and as someone that's been a criminal defense attorney for 20 years, uh, it's not practice and procedural, or a procedure to file a, a C4 motion like this on affirmative defense, especially 
when it's sworn to, when you're forced to give up your Fifth Amendment, another thing on that motion is it's sworn to. So we're dealing with other constitutional provisions. You know, you've got your Fifth but Amendment right. If you're swearing C4, to a motion, just, just you could to be stick with to give the, that up. I'm, I'm concerned about the process and procedure, whether such a thing existed. A C4 motion would not provide for an evidentiary hearing. Correct. It would be based, based only on the filing of a sworn motion to dismiss. You're absolutely right. correct, Justice Department. I suppose to stand your ground, free trial hearing that would require evidence to be presented. You're absolutely correct. Okay. So again, my question is, do you know of any process in place before the standing ground police uh, statutes took effect that would have provided for such an evidentiary hearing prior to trial where a judge from hearing evidence would decide whether or not immunity applies or not? The answer to that question is no. Okay, thank you. I do not. And the reason I might make that argument here is the legislature's intent when they uh, drafted Florida Statute 776.021 and 776.032, collectively known as the Florida Stand Your Ground statutes, their intention was absolute immunity. What the state attorney's office and the attorney general's office has been arguing, I mean, are, are two separate things. And, 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 you know, they want to make this argument that they're two separate arguments, that they're two separate actors. The problem with traveling under 776.05, and we were aware of the Second District Court of Appeals ruling in Camano, we filed our motion under both. And in fact, Justin Usan, who issued the circuit court judge, who issued the order, he granted our motion, not only pursuant to the Florida Stand Your Ground statutes, but also pursuant to Florida, to the Florida use of officer's force during the course of an arrest. We well, then if that's the case, you're, even if we were to rule in, and say that the second district got it right, you have, I, I thought you have a dismissal under 776.05? We wanted to cover all bases. We have a dismissal. Well, I just want, could you just answer that? Yes, Judge, we do. Okay. The other question I have then is, so when, just, so under what vehicle, as Justice Labarga was asking, under what vehicle under 776.05 could you get a dismissal? Uh, there was an evidentiary hearing under both. Is that correct? Yes, Judge. Uh, the second district opinion came out in what year? I believe it was um, Kamano you're referring to. Um, I don't want to, to that, misspeak, but I believe again, I can approximate about um, maybe 2011, 2010. Okay, so and we'd have to use this uh, canon if we find ambiguity. Uh, but the legislature twice after that decision amended the statute and never clarified that it intended stand your ground to include law enforcement officers in their official capacity. Was, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so it's really, would you agree that if we look at both that plus the fact that there was never a common law duty for police officers acting in their lawful capacity to retreat, it would seem odd that the legislature would have intended this statutory scheme to apply to a law enforcement officer in the course of their official duties. I wouldn't agree with that. I would make the following statement, that if the legislature wanted the standard ground laws not to apply to law enforcement officers, specifically my client, Deputy Praza, they would have said the plain meaning of the statute, any person except law enforcement. The statute would have been amended. I mean, what we're dealing here with and why the Camano case in the Second District Court of Appeal, in my opinion, and the Fourth District Court of Appeal's opinion got it wrong, is because they should have never have gotten into the theory of statutory construction because of the plain, mean, the plain language meaning. The term person. When you filed the motion uh, pursuant to 776.05, uh, did you allege or have a sworn affidavit that the, your client was in the process of making an arrest? I did not file a sworn affidavit because I wasn't sure how it was going to be interpreted. I was aware of the Kamano case, but I was aware of this court's rulings in Dennis and Peterson and the procedural outline. And keep in mind, our case was from 2013, and Deputy Peraza, we had the burden of proof in this case. But my thinking at that time was, 
I'm not sure how this is going to be interpreted. So if in paramateria we ever got that far, that I would attempt to harmonize both statutes and that we would use the vehicle as outlined in Dennis and Peterson and not do it pursuant to a C4 sworn motion. I, I thought your position was he was not making an arrest. He was not making an arrest. It was an investigatory stop. But I filed it under both because I was concerned with the Kamano case. I never agreed with the Kamano case. It was out there, and I understood that an argument could be made. My position has always been that it's been an investigatory stop. There's three types of police encounters. You, you did it in case it was somehow found by a court otherwise, that he right. was in a process. Well, it. it brings up, Justice Polston, if I may, an interesting question, because we have three in the law and outlined by the, by the Supreme Court in, in Popol, consensual encounters, investigatory stops, and arrest. Law enforcement officers, lawyers, and some judges get confused when an actual arrest happens versus a consensual encounter or a Terry stop. And, and if we were to have some bright line rule, and it was Justice Kennedy that asked this question to, to Ms. Serber, are you saying that law enforcement officers can use stand your ground when it's not during the course of an arrest? And that's their argument. And that's a dangerous argument that a law enforcement officer who has a dangerous job is making these calculations to protect and to serve, and if there's a bad guy and, and what's going on, then he's got to worry. Well, if, if this is an arrest, if I, if I point a weapon or if I do this, I'm not going to be able to use the same laws as a person. When Deputy Peraza got arrested, he is a deputy, but he wasn't known as deputy defendant. When a doctor gets arrested, it's not doctor defendant, it's the defendant. Why shouldn't any defendant Anyone who's in the criminal justice system, when there's life and liberty, and Deputy Peraza was doing his job and was facing 30 years, why should he not be allowed to use all the statutes available? In particular, when the Florida legislature said any person. I don't think that the second district court should have ever gotten into in paramateria. But if they did, Justice Polston, Mr. Bruno and I, when we filed our motions, we were trying to cover all bases on behalf of our client because we didn't know how this would be interpreted. But we knew, and based upon the facts of this case and the competent substantial evidence that was the 31 witnesses were, that were called and, and what happened in this case and that a man, and, and this case is a tragedy for the decedent as well, but for the man that was shot, I mean, he was marching down Dixie Highway, a very popular highway in Broward County, with a rifle on his shoulders and has given commands. BSO, Broward Sheriff's Office, stop, drop. Okay, Can but you're, you know, you're getting into facts which, again, most respectfully, I, I, was, uh, was this an indictment or an information? It was an indictment. Okay, so a grand jury heard the testimony, and it's, when you say there's very few cases, I mean, f most times in these shootings where a police officer has to shoot a, a citizen, uh, there isn't an indictment. So when you're giving the facts, you're now giving them in the light most favorable to your client, but a grand jury disagreed and made the very rare decision to indict this deputy for manslaughter. So there, there must be some other uh, facts that the, the grand jury heard uh, that isn't right now in your recitation. Actually, Justice Perry, and I have had this case for five years. I was present with Deputy Peraza when um, we went in front of the grand jury. I have, uh, perhaps I regret, and I'll explain why, taking him in front of the grand jury, but I have no regrets about what Deputy Peraza did that day. Stand your ground is a very hot button topic issue on both sides. Deputy Peraza went in front of a grand jury and the saying, and I don't want to be hokey here, but uh, you well, we don't. Is that in the record? ham sandwich. Well, there's record in, in the record <laughs> transcripts that when Deputy Peraza, now the AG's office is making an argument that he never had a duty to retreat. Well, while Deputy Peraza was in front of the grand jury, he was asked questions akin to why didn't he retreat? Why didn't he duck and why didn't he hide behind a car? It is our position that this case was, and that's a separate can, issue. Can I, can I, re a can I refocus this on the, the legal issue that we, yes, we need to decide? Because, and I just want to make sure that I'm correct in my understanding as to, so there, there's a substantive standard in each statute that determines whether the immunity applies, right? And then there's the extent of the immunity, which is apparently, the, has been interpreted differently for each statute. But I'm interested in the substantive standard for when the immunity applies and the difference between the two statutes. And as I understand it, the law enforcement statute 776051 is broader um, in that the newer statute 
provides an immunity for someone who reasonably believes that force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm, right, which is, and then the law enforcement statute applies when the law enforcement officer is acting in the capacity discussed in the statute and reasonably believes, believes that the force is necessary to defend against bodily harm. So it's, it's a, you, it's a lesser, it's a, a standard that provides immunity even when you're not facing great bodily harm or potential death. So that's a, a broader standard it would apply in more cases. Is that right? It does. In fact, it gives a law enforcement officer the term in 776.05 is any force as opposed to deadly force and the imminent threat. You know, it was, there was a witness in this case, and I won't get so much into the facts, that said this was more than an imminent threat. This was an immediate threat. That means something was about to happen. But so just so in, a, in a case like this where the finding, I mean, we've already had a hearing, the finding is that this officer um, reasonable, reasonably believed that he was facing death or imminent bodily harm. That, that would meet both standards. Either one would apply, correct? Yes, Judge. Okay. Um, why wouldn't the way to harmonize these statutes be that the any person statute will apply in circumstances where the person meets that standard, which wouldn't necessarily be true in all arrests, that that statute would apply, and then if that statute doesn't apply, the person doesn't reasonably believe that they're facing death or imminent bodily harm, but they are an officer making an arrest and think that they face bodily harm, that, you know, why, why wouldn't the statute then apply to those cases that are covered by the law enforcement statute but are not covered by the any person statute? Justice Lawson, I think you can put, there's many ways to put the horse in the barn here. You can harmonize, if that's, if I'm understanding your question, the statutes that way, and you can read them that way if it's determined, if you get past the plain meaning of the statute, which is any person. But, yeah. you know, I, if I can point something out, you know, we're talking about 776.05, and I want to talk about some preposterous thing that would never be the, le the intent of the legislature. It says a law enforcement officer or any person, there's that term person again, whom the officer has summoned or directed to assist him or her need not retreat or desist. So let's say we have a scenario where Deputy Smith summons Citizen Jones to help him arresting a bad guy. And in that scenario, the gun gets loose and it's termed reasonable. The citizen shoots the bad guy and the bad guy dies. Did the legislature intend that under that scenario that at a jury trial, which is past the immunity stage, that that citizen, that any person, because they're arguing it's a citizenry statute, would only get to argue the affirmative defense, but wouldn't get to use the stand your ground statute as well? Because the 776.05, if you delve into it, also again deals with any person. And that certainly would never have been the intention of the legislature when they drafted that law. Does the rule of lenity apply at all to these type of defensive statutes? It should, but I don't know if we get there, Justice Polston. I mean, if, if, if there's any ambiguity, the rule of lenity would apply in favor of Deputy Peraza. But I just can't get past, and I don't. And, and with all due respect to the Office of the Attorney General and the State Attorney's Office, I've never been able to wrap my head, and I guess with all due respect to the Second District Court of Appeal as well too, but I've never been able to wrap my head around the argument that <clears throat> when a statute says any person can use this law, that somehow Deputy Praza or a deputy or any law enforcement officer is precluded from using any defense. All defendants should be entitled to use every defense. I'm going to ask, and my time is running out, Justices, so I, I would ask that you continue to find that Deputy Peraza was an investigatory stop, not an arrest, which wouldn't put this into play. But more importantly, in this day and age, when people need more protection than ever, I'm going to ask that there's law enforcement officers are allowed to use your stand your ground law because that was the intention of the legislature and that you uphold the circuit court ruling and the Fourth District Court of Appeals ruling. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Now, you, you have consumed most of your uh, rebuttal time. However, I will give you five minutes. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. I want to start with this, the state disputes that the defendant is immune 
no matter what under this case because we are arguing that the procedure is a 3.190 and that is a disputed facts procedure. If there are disputed facts which are referenced in the trial judge's written order as well as the fourth DCA opinion in certifying the conflict in recognizing there are conflicts or evidence that supports was both this, theories. Was this actually in the, in, in the, was the police officer actually in the process of an arrest here? It, and was there any finding to that effect? The trial judge found that the facts supported that theory. However, if you read the fourth district's opinion, the fourth also said that the facts support the theory that the officer was being or was in the course of arrest. If you're asking not in the course of arrest, I'm saying, that's what was the trial it, court's no, order is said. Is it in the course of arrest? In the course of an arrest. The fourth district court of appeal, in the opinion in evaluating the facts adduced, said that the facts could support both theories. And that, that what, did the trial court, what did the trial court find? The trial court found that the facts supported the theory of arrest. And, and so, that's what distinguished it from Kamano. That is why this case proceeded on the conflict. And if there was a factual distinction with Kamano but on would you the certified agree, question. Would you agree that if it was not in the course of an arrest, then 776.05 would not be applicable. If the facts are undisputed that it was not in the course of an arrest. And the reason I say that is because in Lozano, there was some language from that case that the fact of an arrest can be a question of fact for the jury. It, it, it simply, it comes down to, and I, I don't mean to come back to the first thing I said, but this court's reasoning in Brethrick, I understand it's still a criminal scenario, but again, we have law enforcement officers with a statute that was enacted in the 1970s, which codified the fact that officers did not have a duty to retreat. That case law goes back to 1928. It is cited in the reply brief. So that is why we're arguing you have to separate the two because this court mandates when looking at it, you need to determine what are these statutes addressing? And because there seems to be some confusion what a person might mean, the legislative history of the Stand Your Ground statute speaks directly to that when it references that law enforcement were already protected from liability under 77605. And to go back to what Judge Le Justice Labargo was saying, excuse me, um, before Stand Your Ground, was enacted, you know, we're trying to almost fit a round peg into a square hole. Before the Stand Your Ground Law was enacted, the only procedure available was a C4 motion. There's not a lot of cases. I think Justice Perriente hit the nail on the head. These cases are not going to be charged all the time. You don't see a lot of information. It is rare that indictments happen. And you know, with the political climate surrounding this case in the last few years, I think we know it is a big deal. But and here's the thing, That's, those are all great policy arguments. It's not a legal statutory construction argument. And if this officer was not in the course of making an arrest, then 776.05 doesn't apply. If, if it's undisputed. And well, that's, but just yes. let's, let's assume it's undisputed that he wasn't. Then that statute doesn't apply. Then there's, is there any other statute under 776 that covers uh, the officer's uh, uh, defenses, so to speak. Well, and that's what goes to the question that stand your ground may apply in some circumstances, well, but in this, this circumstance... Is, this is logically what I don't understand. Why, why would you say there are two statutes that may apply, and so we're going to take the one that applies when making an arrest, which we can't determine pretrial, but um, assuming that that might apply, then that's going to trump the other statute. Why, why wouldn't you instead say let's see if the statute that applies to any person applies. And if it does, then that person gets the benefit of that statute. And if it doesn't, then, you know, we go to trial and we figure out whether it was an arrest or wasn't an arrest when those things have to be determined. Why, why wouldn't you approach it by starting with the any person statute and saying, does that apply? rather than the special statute? Because the law enforcement statute has been in effect much longer, and we know that if that statute applies, 
officers were subject to the more rigid standard. Is there some principle law that the first statute that's enacted is the one that you look at first? The more I mean, specific statute. The, well, Be this specifically applies to any person. That's pretty specific. But I think, again, we're getting into whether you know, the plain meaning of a statute. And it's not just what is the plain if, meaning if say. If you're looking at the time of I'm the sorry. statutory enactment, I'm not talking about that time. I will oh. in a minute, though. Uh, <laughs> If you're talking about the time of the enactment of the statute, in the, in the general rule that the more recent statute would apply, not the one that's been in force a long time. No, it, well, I, I understand, but we're not just looking at the one word. We're but if you were looking at time, you talked about time. <laughs> you're, the, you're the one that talked about time. Because that's significant in, in looking at the legislature knows when it enacted the new statute that the law enforcement statute was in existence. And they noted that, and you then have to look at the plain language of the statute in conjunction with general versus specific. Both tests well, have it, to be looked at. That is they, under Floyd. If they, why are we assuming that if they knew about the statute and had it in mind, and they did not want the statute that applied to any person to apply in those circumstances, why wouldn't they draft a statute as Justice LaBarga suggests that says, any person except a law enforcement officer pursuing under the other statute. I mean, that. They, they essentially did that when they cited to the three statutes under which the 032 immunity could apply. Let me just ask, I know you're, I guess, into I your apologize. additional time, but if we, agree, if we agree that the stand your ground applies, then does it, is there any reason to have 776.05? Doesn't it nullify that? Under the Kamano decision, in, in it would seem in this scenario it would nullify it. I mean, is it, I, I mean that I didn't hear that argument being made, but it seems that that statute would override and make 776.05 unnecessary. But but what? But how do you respond in connection with that? How do you respond to what Justice Lawson said about the different scope of those statutes, and the fact that the the scope of the law enforcement statute is actually broader. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the way it's spread. Right, and that's a good, uh, so that answers my question. Well, well I'm glad to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you. I, mean, I think that also shows the legislature in enacting the law enforcement statutes envisioned broader protections under that statute for law enforcement. I mean, you do have other statutes that address other types of force, so I think we do need to look at them all together. And if there are no further questions, we would ask that you reverse the decision of the Fourth District Court of Appeal. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you both for your arguments. The court will now stand in recess for about 10 minutes. All rise.